Well, it gives me pleasure to present Mr. Ron Tinslow. <laughs> Thanks, Howard. I wish I didn't have to talk into this thing. Do you guys really need this thing? It's required. Oh, yes. It's required? Because you're being for posterity. Oh, I am. Okay. So as Howard said, I'm, uh, I've been an engineer. I started out as a farmer, actually, uh, working for my dad on an organic farm for many years, 10 years for him. And then I went to college and got a degree in aerospace engineering and uh, ended up working for 15 years for Northrop Grumman doing design, build, test, and deliver of major aircraft components, mostly related to the F-18 through the JSF, which uh, the JSF, as you know, is Joint Strike Fighter, is just now coming to operational status. So, but then I had an ethical challenge <laughs> and decided that, uh, you know, I'm ready to move on. And so I uh, traveled around the world, Asia, and never got south of the equator, but uh, ended up um, back in Hawaii uh, from California. And um, now I studied Lomi Lomi Massage and Hawaiian culture, and then uh, now I'm back in school getting a degree in sustainable development. And uh, that sounds like an oxymoron, and it isn't. <laughs> Um, so uh, today I'm going to present a little bit about what I've learned this last semester about sustainable development. I hope that will be of interest to you. I use the canoe as a metaphor because today, uh, given the complexity that we have been able to observe and see around us, metaphors, mo visual models are really the only way we can use to understand complex subjects. The, the climate is a complex, very complex subject. The planet itself is a complex subject in the process of developing. And so uh, I use the canoe as a metaphor because we are in a canoe. We are actually floating in a sea of space. We're on a spaceship, as Buckminster Fuller, Fuller said. And so, and here we can see the effect of our actions over the last century. This is industrialization. This is what industrialization has brought to the, the planet, a lot of light, but also a lot of so-called darkness in the case of extermination of species and uh, environmental degradation. So today, uh, I'm going to set the frame as the canoe. Uh, frames, again, are much, much like metaphors. They're simplifications of complex things, ways to have people understand the challenges of today. I got 30 minutes? Okay, well, we'll try to do that. So I'm going to talk about these things, frames, ecological, economic, sustainable development, HIPL, and wrap up. So that was my, that's my little outline. Where I first started my kind of shifting my vision was on this piece of land in uh, Los Angeles, right next to Marina del Rey and uh, LAX, which is right there, LMU. As you can see, this was a huge 3,000 acre wetland at one point, and Marina del Rey took up about 50% of it. What's left of it was this open piece of land here. Steven Spielberg wanted to build his DreamWorks studio out here. This was a Howard, old Howard Hughes uh, plant, actually. He was given this land after the oil ran out because he was good at making bombs and spruce goose, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, it ended up in the hands of McGuire Thomas Partners. They settled with these residents here who wanted to protect their view planes. They settled with them to protect 200 acres down here. And then I came on the scene in 1994, and uh, three others, me and three others, decided, well, we weren't going to settle for that. So we started a whole new group, a land trust, which has become very popular around uh, nationally and even in Hawaii. And we ended up saving 640 acres on the top of the 240 acres that originally saved. And so, uh, but my point is, is that this is the view that the developer often gave you, the plan form view the plan view. And you know, it's fairly stark, as plan views are supposed to be. That's what they do. They just give you the basic sketch. And, th and they, sometimes you would see this one. And so I shot this one. And I said, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, wow, the development is way back here. It looks really small. Of course, it's, it's uh, stretched in the foreground and shortened in the background. And so I went up in the helicopter, and I shot it the other way. And I was like, oh, that's why developers choose these nondescript views is because they show the minimal amount of information. And what you see when you look here is how short and small the development is with respect to all the, I mean, the wetlands are with respect to all the other development. And so that gave me an idea that 
if we just change our perspective, sometimes we can change the way we think about things. And so this is also in uh, alignment with um, poetry and uh, philosophers who says, hey, we don't have to go anywhere, we just have to have new eyes. So let me change your perspective a little bit. Does anybody know what this is? Earth. It's Earth. And what is this here? Saturn. It's a no. It's a sunbeam. It's just a sunbeam. <laughs> and this is four billion miles away. Voyager shot this when it got four billion miles away. Turned around and looked at the Earth and shot this. And all the pain and all the success and all the humans and all the mothers and all the fathers and all the children and all the degradation and all the industrialization all happened on this little thing, or this little spaceship in the middle of space. And it really gives us some perspective just about who we really are. And this is a question that is essential to sustainable development. Uh, this picture uh, spawned, spawned uh, Earth Day, uh, spawned a whole environmental movement in the United States. This was 1968 as the spacecraft came around the moon. And you often see this the other way around with the Earth on top, but, but this is the real orientation of what happened. The spacecraft was coming around the moon like this and came out and shot this, this uh, image. This is the first image that people had seen of the Earth. And to see who we are, to see that we are in this spaceship alone, all together, <laughs> whether we like it or not. I worked on this movie a few years ago, Lost, and Lost, again, was about a spaceship. It was about people lost on an island, and they were trying to figure out what to do. What do how do we respond to each other? Of course, they chose the old kind of political, you know, it wasn't very much inspiration in that, in that it was all about drama and all. And so I just used that slide to talk a little bit about, again, how much how much metaphor and framing and uh, philosophy is necessary. This is what is known and this is what is unknown. We are in a world that's in an existence that is, is quite unknown, quite mysterious. And largely when we're talking about these kind of complex subjects, we're taking things that aren't even seeable, like the future, the children of the future. They're, they're not even visible. Or climate, sometimes climate isn't even visible unless it has an effect. Or these future threats that are coming down the pipe that science says that are changing our world. So we're making the invisible visible. And there's quite a few big problems happening on the planet. We have all of these things going on all at once, not to speak of the minor political things. These are climatic, global problems that are, that are occurring right as we speak. And so the question is, how do we adapt? How do we respond? Who are we in this set of problems that are coming? And what are we going to do about it? And that's what sustainable development is about. It's an answer to what are we going to do about it. Any one of these can change our lives dramatically, and they're all happening at the same time. And Paul Hawkins says, at present we are stealing the future, selling the present, and calling it gross domestic product. We can just as easily have an economy that is based on healing the future instead of stealing it. We can either create assets for the future or take the assets of the future. And basically, our economic system today is the process of transferring assets from the future to the present so that we can consume them. That's what debt does. Debt is that, that, that um, process of stealing from the future. So he says it's just as easy, and many people say that if we just change our focus, and this is what, again, what sustainable development says we can do. If we just change our focus from this consumptive way to another way, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Again, E is equal to MC squared. You've got energy, mass, light. This is energy, this is mass, and this is meaning. So if we just change our focus, we just change the, thing, the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. This, I don't know if you guys recognize this, this is a chart that came out in the 70s from the limits of growth. And they were taking, this was pre, this was punch card computer days, which many of you remember. I even got in on the tail end of punch cards. They used punch cards to run computer programs to uh, project out into our time frame, 2000, 2010, 2011 time frame, what 
was going to happen with all these different variables, industrial population, food, pollution, resources. And they showed that there was a peak. And the main thing to look at here is that there's a peak right around 2020, 2010, and then a sudden drop off either in population or in food or in you know pollution peak somewhat later. So these were well known. This is the Club of Rome, as you may know. And so we have these concept of limits, which isn't built into our economic system or even into our industrial development model. And there's these problems, the most of which probably is institutional delays, like government. You know, how does government, how do institutions respond? Under, over what time period do they respond? How do they respond when they're ritualistic and slow moving, when the, the world is moving in an exponential way? And so one of these ways that Howard is, and others may be very well familiar with is footprint analysis. How do we understand what our footprint is? This is a population curve that you may be familiar with or not, but I'm going to run quickly through it. First modern humans came on the planet in 160,000 BC, so, so to speak. Could be Adam and Eve, if you believe. And then it took uh, you know, almost 160,000 years to get to a quarter of a billion people, but it only took another 1,400, 1,500 years to get to half a billion. And then you can see what the power of exponential really means. 1776, when our nation, this uh, nation of America was founded. 2007 and 2011, just last November, just November, we passed the seven billion mark. So in four years, we, the whole, the population of the United States today was born and expressed on this planet just in four years. So that's the power of exponential. And population demogra demographers say that by 2050 we'll hit 9 billion. And you might notice that there's a flattening out of population there. And I don't know if you, uh, if you might understand what that means, but that means a lot of people are going to die or not be born, one of the two. And so the question is, now that we're here in 2011, how do we respond to that? What are, what are our choices going to be? Biological populations irrespective of our conscious choices or our industrial choices, biological populations only respond in one or two ways. This is individuals, this is time, the region or the ecology has a carrying capacity. In other words, the maximum number of population that can be uh, supported within that uh, region. One particular type responds this way, this uh, rabbits. They go exponentially grow, they overshoot their population, their carrying capacity, and then they crash. And then they drop and they bounce around at the bottom until they repeat it again. Now, there's another type of population that's called K-selected, and that's an example of bears. And they go up and they spread out and they realize their limits. They actually flatten out and reach a stasis point, an equilibrium. And the question is, which one are we? After all, with all this information we have today, it is a conscious choice now. We can make conscious choices about what we do because we have the information. Impact is equal to population times affluence times technology is the, is the typical kind of way to look at it. Impact of humans is equal to population times affluence of the people, which is really directly related to fossil fuels, times the technology, which is also related to fossil fuels. This is a footprint analysis. It shows that the carrying capacity of the Earth is one. The number of planet Earths that can support us all is one. And so somewhere around the, 70, um, the 80s, well, yeah, around 85, we passed that as a whole, globally. And we're in ecological debt. In other words, the services that the Earth provides, clean water, clean air, food, all these services that the Earth provides are not being regenerated every year. In other words, it, 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 it's like your taxes. Your taxes keep going up, and so the, the day that it takes, the amount of days it takes you to pay those taxes keeps getting longer and longer. Well, this, the amount of days that we begin to use up the Earth's one year regeneration capacity gets shorter and shorter. Right now it's in September, as opposed to, say, December 31st. So we're in this time period, we've moved back from December, three months of the year. So you can project outwards as to where we might end up not being able to um, provide support services for humans. And so the question is, are we going to bend this curve down through our conscious 
choices through our sustainable development, bend this curve down and recross this line and end in an inflection point, I mean, end in an equilibrium point that's underneath of the biocapacity reserve of the planet? That's the question. We don't know. And yet our institutions and the way humans themselves are actually responding to these are linear. In other words, I mean, how, how difficult is it to get this church to do something new? Yeah? I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, how difficult is it to get anybody to do something new? We have to be convinced of it. Then we have to be shown examples. And then we have to like go, okay, that's good for me. And then we got to go, okay, now how do I incorporate it in my life? So that's linear. And the question is, if all this is going exponential, how are we as humans going to adapt? How are we going to change our linear behavior to a, a transformative, adaptive behavior? And that's not clear. This is just another way of looking at it. This is gross national product versus time. And in an empty world where there were a lot of nature and a little bit of humans, we had this relationship. But as we industrialized and we grew, we replaced animals and nature with humans and built environment. And so this is called the sigmoid curve. And this is a central theme in sustainable development. Natural capital should be considered. Right now we're only considering financial capital or human capital. We don't consider natural capital as capital. And so when natural capital is abundant, human capital is scarce, we can consume natural capital to enhance human capital. But today we're in a different world. We're in a full world. We're not in an empty world. We're in a full world when human capital is abundant, natural capital is scarce, we must conserve and enhance natural capital because it's scarce. And so we need to make that switch. And that's one of the fundamental problems with our economic system is that it does not recognize the value of natural capital. And to conclude, before the earth collapses between the strain of men, will we be able to make a great big profits from its few remaining resources? Well, that seems to be what we're trying to do today is jumpstart growth, print more money, print more debt, so that we can have growth today at the expense of tomorrow. But Ray Anderson, I don't know, you guys should check out Ray Anderson. He just passed away recently. He came to Hawaii a few years ago. But he's a businessman who uh, revolutionized carpets, <laughs> flooring. He created modular carpets. And he took his company from a very wasteful petroleum um, usage company, dropped their uh, use of petroleum by 60%, reduced their waste, and became a businessman who asked this question, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? There is no business case for ending life on Earth. But it's a good question to inform ourselves. Again, a kind of metaphorical, simple question that frames the whole discussion. And so this is, by and large, the visual model. And I'm very much into visual models, because again, there, there are ways to, to simplify complexity. And so I use visual models a lot. This is called the Mickey Mouse economic model. <laughs> because it's in terms of scale and importance and connectivity. There's no connectivity here, basically. Very little, maybe close. And scale and then importance, you see what is most important. And that is at the heart of, um, in my view, the problem with our economic model. So this is our economic model from the books. <laughs> It's a simple model. Households on one end, firms on the other. Goods and services flow from firms to households. Factors for production flow from households to firms. Wages, rents, dividends, and consumer expenditures, all in a circulatory flow. Simple, right? Inclusive, right? Actually, it doesn't include anything else other than it doesn't include the planet, doesn't include um, natural capital, doesn't include it's a circulatory model only. It consumes that it can continue forever. It's not a very good model. It's very simplified. It came from the 1800s. Why are we still using it today? Well, tradition, as Ben Bernanke says. Um, 
the vision of this was in an empty world. It's a closed circular model. It only is good at the macro level and, and that it allocates resources uh, efficiently in that way. It's fundamentally built on growth. It's abstract in that it has no relationship to reality. And it believes that everything is substitutable. You run out of one thing, substitute something else. Well, that's not really reality. Can't substitute nature for humans is one really big one. Um, cons, there's no limits, no throughput, no scale and limit, no distribution. Human-made capital is equal to, equal to natural capital. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The atom is homo economicus. The atom of the neoclassical thing is a Neanderthal hunter-gatherer. Now, how many of us are Neanderthal hunter-gatherers? Well, I could be one if, <laughs> if I was left alone in the fields, perhaps, but we don't operate that way. We're conscious, evolving human beings, and our economic system believes that we're only eaters and seekers and trackers, and that is a big problem. And this model is subject to brittle failures. Now, I don't, I don't know how many of you are structural engineers, but that's what I was, a structural engineer, and a brittle failure is the one you don't want. You don't want a brittle failure unless you design for a brittle failure but you really don't want a brittle failure. You want a graceful failure that has backup. And not only that, it's corruptible. And this guy was at the UNDP, and he's a very prolific writer. Yes Magazine is his magazine. Very good person if you ever get a chance to read him. Economic crisis is a moral crisis. Okay, so it's a moral crisis. Now what? Well, we gotta focus on values. So how do we move towards sustainability? How do we get to the place we want to be? How do we be the people we want to be? Well, this is the definition of sustainability that came out of the 1987 Brundtland Commission. It's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, that I highlighted these words because this is development. Snowballs grow. Humans develop. Neoclassical economy believes in snowballs and not humans, because it says growth is the ultimate metric. Future, there's no future in neoclassical ec economics. There's no intergenerational equity. There's only intragenerational focus. In other words, this generation is the only one that matters. And it focuses on wants, not needs. So there's two types of sustainability, weak sustainability and strong sustainability. And I just want you to know that we don't have to talk about that in the interest of time, but I want you to know that we're not practicing strong sustainability, we're practicing weak sustainability at the moment when we talk about triple bottom line. That's weak sustainability. <clears throat> so this is the model for weak sustainability that you all are familiar with. People, profits, and planet. Livability, equity, and viability. And in the middle at the nexus and the interface is sustainability, that's what we're calling it. But it's not really sustainability because People and profits and planet aren't equal anymore. We're in a full world. We need to make this more of a focus and this a focus and try to get away from this if we can. Not saying that we shouldn't have economic way means, but get away from pro the scale of these circles being equal. These circles cannot be equal in a full world. They have to be sized correctly. Oh, here's the ends mean spectrum. I'll just show this to you quickly. Basically, all of our politics and all of our uh, economics comes from low entropy materials. And we're running out of low entropy materials as oil and silver and all these things. Were, they're, they're not being replenished. They're non-renewable materials. And we're ignoring our highest potential. And this is what sustainable development says. Sustainable development says we have a much higher potential. We have a much bigger capacity to do and make the right choices, and we're really focused in this political economy space where we're brainwashed into thinking that we can't do more than what we're doing, that we can't be greater than who we think we are. And our devices and our, all our, you know, 96% of the devices that we produce are in the landfill in six months. That's not a, that's a take, make, waste model, not a circular feedback loop, zero waste model. I want you to think of, the economy is an hourglass. We get energy from the sun, it flows through a flows through space, and it hits the earth. And that pretty much doesn't vary. It's fairly constant. And the earth grows or develops 
and all of our energy come, most of our energy comes from the sun. But what we're doing is we're opening this valve here and we're taking all of this low entropy material that came from millions of years of development and we're turning it into waste matter. This is Herman Daly, by the way. You should, uh, he's pretty much a poet. You can look at his videos on YouTube. 300 years ago, we were an empty world and our people and our economy was fairly small, had a small effect on the planet. And then today we're in a full world and our people and our economy are, have a much bigger footprint. And so this is really the essence of sustainable development is that our economic system, that we're, our set of agreements that we have with each other is flawed because we're in a different world now than we were then. Okay, so let's compare and contrast a little bit just to give you a really quick uh, summary of industrial development, which we've had for the last 150 years, and sustainable development. Growth versus development. You know, two different things. Growth is development, you know? We're not a snowball. We just can't keep getting bigger. But we can develop. We can get better. There's absolutely no reason, no limit, that human's potential can't be increased well beyond what it is today. There's no reason. Look at what we've done so far in terms of our development. Certainly. Natural capital is the most important thing in sustainable development. Financial capital is the most important thing in industrial development. Process. What is the process that we're processes that we're using? What are the products that we are making? Quality versus quantity. I mean, look how far away from quality we've gotten in our lives. Holism versus mechanism. You know, there's a, there's a certain oneness to all of God's creation. And we're just tearing it apart. Collaboration versus competitiveness. This is a big one for me as I get out of school and I see competitiveness everywhere. In nonprofit world, everywhere. It really has been an eye-opener. Potential versus productivity. Scale, distribution, and allocation. This is the one we're going to talk about in the next couple slides. And allocation, I'll talk about that. Intergenerational needs between generations and intra-generation once. So right now we got a model that promotes gimme, 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 me, me, me in my generation right now. We're stealing the future to give us lifestyle in the present. And sustainable development says no, no, no. We need to have an intergenerational dialogue and we have to evaluate the needs of future generations so that we can scale our own activities. And then the stronger sustainability model that I'm going to talk about is this nested model. It says that economics should serve people and people should serve the planet, basically. And now you can start to see that there's a stronger theoretical visual model for our behavior. Everything should be in service to the people and the planet. The economy should be scaled according to that relationship. So this is the sustainable development model that describes what a sustainable development practitioner should look like. And this is the minimum set of, of things. It's, an, it's a multidisciplinary practitioner. So if you see yourself in one of these four circles in terms of your, your life's work, then that's good. If you see yourself in multiple circles, then you may be uh, considered a sustainable development practitioner. So this is kind of an academic minimum that uh, we like to see for sustainable development practitioners. Natural sciences, health sciences, management, which is business, and social sciences, which is studying ourselves. So here's the thing that comes from ecological economics. I like to talk about this one because it's called an economic plimsoll line. Now, a plimsoll line is an interesting concept on a boat. It's these lines here. It's how high can you load the boat? before you end up getting it below the waterline or before it's unstable. Harbor masters, the world around, wanted to know the boats that are coming into harbor, how heavy are they loaded? Number one, maybe for taxes, but number two, they didn't want any boat capsizing in their harbor and blocking up their business for years and years and years. So they came up with this idea of a plimsoll line. And this is an indication of scale. If the boat is the earth and the cargo is the people and their stuff, and the things we've converted from natural, world, natural capital to human capital or to stuff capital, then we need an economic plimsoll line. 
This line says, when is enough enough? How heavy can you load the boat? How much can you put in it? How is it allocated among the crew? Where is it distributed across the boat itself? We need this type of policymaking instrument in our economics, and right now we don't have that. So that's the concept of an economic plimsoll line. And the questions we would ask here, how big is our economic subsystem relative to our canoe? How big can it be without sinking our canoe? How big should it be in order to optimize life in our canoe? So these are progressively more complicated questions that we need to ask to create this policy instrument. Biomimicry, you guys probably as engineers very interested in biomimicry. That's a huge one for kids. I always pull these slides out when uh, I'm presenting to kids because they love this stuff. Butterfly wings, Sony's MP3 player. The, Totally did it when I was at North. We were looking at tiger shark noses and deciding the shape for airplane, uh, for the airplane wing. This is my favorite. The Namibian beetle takes, see that ridge down the middle of his back? He takes, he's in the desert, and he takes water that condenses on his back, and it runs down the channel right into his mouth. And so Israeli researchers figured this out, and they take these claws, and they hang them in the wind, and the air comes along, the moisture hits the thing, it condenses, and it runs right down into their catchment. Adaptive strategy, we talk about forecasts. Wrong approach. We should be using backcasting. We should say, where do we want to be, and then how do we get there? When we take a trip, we don't say, okay, I forecast that I'll be in, you know, Athens. Tomorrow, we say, no, I want to go to Athens. How do I get to Athens? So this is, visioning is a really important part of, of this adaptive strategy called backcasting. This is my organization, Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light. We're a nonprofit. We help churches encourage them to adopt stewardship values, energy conservation, and uh, be more efficient and have renewable energies. We've been through great transitions before, humans, our population, we can do it again. When we discovered fire, we went through a huge transition. When we, when we learned how to speak, boy, it changed our, our lives. When we developed agriculture, boy, we were really pumping out, pumping out the babies then. You know, and agriculture is really what got us to this place. And then fossil fuels, that's, what, that's the only reason we're where we are today is because we got cheap energy. And the next one is what? Well, I don't know. Is it conscious evolution? You know, we evolve in a conscious way. We make choices together. I don't know. I hope so. But we got to think outside the box, and we can't adopt this type of behavior. Okay, so the last three or four slides. There's four ways of looking at time, not three ways. It's usually past, present, future. It's actually past, present, future, future splits into what, it's, what momentum will take us, what the, path, what the future will if we continue on our path, or what we can choose, what the future should be. And so which are we going to choose? We have to decide. Because this poet, Terry Tempest Williams, is saying that our children are looking back at us from the future, whether they're visible or invisible or expressed or unexpressed. We should do it for them. So we need to ask ourselves, what's our vision, so that then we can backcast from there where we want to be instead of saying, oh, we're doom and gloom, we're headed somewhere we don't want to be. We just say, where do we want to be? And we go there. And that's, that's the essence of uh, my approach to sustainable development in terms of the internal approach because there's an internal and an external approach to sustainable development. And I encourage you to read the Earth Charter. What a great document that is. And these books. And that's it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Kinslow. One reason that EAH has lasted for 105 years, I believe it is now, is that we start on time and end on time, which is why Good. we ended on time. And now if you will take the end of this paper and smile at that nice man, oh. <laughs> we will get there for posterity. Thank you. There we are. And this is, yes, that is for you. And since we had the rush, 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 I know that people are just primed with questions. There's one person in here, this room who's going to tell you that the way to global cooling is through. Well, number one, we're not warming anyway. Number two, if we wanted to do something about it, it would be nuclear energy. So that person will doubtlessly 
be talking to you as you're munching your sandwich. So, we yeah, officially adjourned this meeting, and you can stay around for a while. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of conversation here. Thank you so much, Mr. Kinslow. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>